Hi everyone and welcome back to a new video. This time we will talk about R squared, the coefficient of determination colloquially known as variance explained. You can calculate the statistic for every analysis that is using ordinary least squares, which is for instance the t-test, ANOVA, correlations or simple or multiple regression. First, a reminder about variance is. I have a whole video about variance, but a brief summary here. The variance is one measure of spread of your data. To calculate the variance of a variable, you subtract the mean of this variable from every data point and you square the differences. Next, you add them all up and then divide them by the number of data points, or in this case by the degrees of freedom, which is the number of data points minus 1. We will use degrees of freedom for the remainder of this video, but it also applies to the case when you divide by n instead of n minus 1. The variance of this variable is 4.72. Importantly, for R squared, you can partition the variance of a dependent variable of your model into explained and unexplained variants, which are mutually exclusive. In this case here, roughly one third of the variance is explained and 70% are unexplained. Now, R squared, the percentage of variance explained, is equal to 1 minus the ratio of unexplained variance to total variance, which is equal to the ratio of explained to total variance. Important here is that the total variance is calculated using the grand mean, as seen previously. This means that the benchmark for the variance explained statistic is the grand mean. We will see in a minute what this looks like, but let's briefly stay with the partition of variance. With this partition of variance is the same concept you do when you calculate ANOVAs, with the exception that there are called sums of squares there, which are however a part of the variance, as seen here. In ANOVA, they are called sums of squares within, or error, and sums of squares between, or treatment, which add up to form the sums of squares total. When you do the same in the context of regression, the sum of squares between might be called sums of squares regression and the sums of squares within might be called sums of squares residual. We will now look at a more visual explanation for this partition of variance. Let's start with the same data we saw earlier when introducing variance. Next, let's add another variable, a grouping, and keep the original values in grey on the left. You can imagine them like shadows of the data points when you add a light source on the right. It is just the data without grouping. This grouping could be something like a placebo and an intervention group, for example. You might want to analyze it with a t-test or the regression. This model would suggest a line connecting the mean values of both groups, predicting the outcome values using the group variable. When you say someone belongs to the blue group, the model will predict an outcome of 3, where a member of the yellow group it will predict 6, the mean values of either group. These values deviate from the grand mean of the outcome variable, so the model explains some of the variance in the outcome. This is what I meant earlier when I said that the grand mean will be the benchmark. Let's add that to the figure. Now you calculate again a type of variance, but this time you don't use the data points, but you replace them by the predicted value for each group, 3 and 6 respectively. The squared deviations are the same for all because the differences with the grand mean are negative 1.5 and 1.5. You add the squared deviations, which in this case just means to multiply it by 10 because they're all the same, and then you divide it by the degrees of freedom, n minus 1. This is your explained variance. This would be enough to calculate R squared, but let's first find the unexplained variance the same way, even though we could see here that it will be 2.22. Now you calculate another type of variance, and this time you use the original data points again. However, instead of the grand mean of the outcome variable, you subtract the mean values of either group, which is the prediction of the model. As usual, you square the differences, add them up, and divide by n-1. In this case, the squares are either 4 or 1, because the differences are 1 or 2, or the negatives of them. This is the unexplained variance, because your model is blind for this part of the variation. Let's now combine what we did so far. These are all the different variances we calculated. Let's line them up according to the partition formula. We see that the variance explained is a little bit over 50%. Although it is correct, I think it is not as intuitive as it could be because the idea that explaining variance literally means that you reduce the variance in your outcome is lost. So we will now look at it from this angle. First, we need to establish the concept that variance is invariant to an equal shift of all data points. So when you add or subtract the same number to all data points, the variance stays the same. 
Now we split the data by the grouping variable again as we saw earlier. Again, the line represents your model, the idea that people of the yellow group will on average have higher values than people from the blue group. Now you align the data points of both groups by their mean values so that the line connecting them will become horizontal. Note what happens to the gray data points, which still represent the original ungrouped data. The outcome values in gray come closer together when rotating the line and keeping the data points at the same distance. In case you're interested, these are the residuals of the model. Technically, because of the way ordinary least squares work, the residuals would have a mean of zero, so we would need to change the numbers from our original coordinate system. However, this is not really important right now, so I will only show you generic coordinate systems for the other examples that are following. Now, let's again calculate the variance of this new gray outcome variable. It is the same value we saw before for the unexplained variance. In fact, what we did is that we removed the variance in the outcome that our model can explain by rotating the line and thereby setting it to zero. What remains needs to be what the model cannot explain. Of course, the value of R squared and the effect this rotation has depends on the grouping variable. Let's use a different one. Now you might see that the blue and yellow points are not as well separated compared to the first grouping. When we do the same as before and rotate the line, we will see that the gray points will not be as close together compared to the first grouping. Consequently, the unexplained variance is higher, so the R squared is low. There is not much variance in the outcome explained by this grouping. Let's now do the same again, but with different predictor variables to see that the concept can be used for different data types as well. We start with a data structure that might seem to be of an ANOVA type to you with three groups. You again connect the mean values by lines and move the points and rotate the lines so that they become horizontal. Next, you again calculate the variance of the gray points. Just as before, you can use this value to calculate R squared. Now, as a last example, we will use a continuous variable instead of a grouping, like so. The idea is exactly the same. We imagine that each point is connected to the regression line by a vertical line with a fixed length. Then you rotate the regression line, keeping the x values of the data points and the distance to the line the same. This is basically the same as before, but because we have so many more x values, it looks a bit messier. As a next step, you can calculate the unexplained variance as usual and calculate R squared. You see, the concept of R squared can be used in a variety of analyses, which might seem quite different at a first glance. You might already know that the symbol for Pearson's correlation coefficient is the letter R as well. And indeed, R squared is nothing more than Pearson's correlation squared. This is an interesting aspect of R-squared in my opinion, so I want to discuss a bit deeper and show that this is indeed the case. R-squared is the ratio of explained variance to total variance, Sy hat squared divided by Sy squared. In case you don't know, the hat indicates that these y are predicted by a model, as we saw earlier when discussing the different types of variances. Pearson's R has many definitions, but the most prominent is that it equals the covariance of both variables divided by the product of their standard deviations. So to show that R squared is indeed Pearson's R squared, we need to show that the definitions are equal except for the square. Let's start by reminding us what covariance is. It is related to variance, but where variance is a function of only one variable, covariance involves both an X and a Y variable. For each data point, you calculate the difference between it and the mean of either variable and multiply these values and add these up before you divide it by the degrees of freedom, n minus one. This is what gives the correlation its sign, because it can be either positive or negative. In this case here, the covariance is positive 6. For a line with a negative slope, it will be negative. Now we can come back to our proof. We start by replacing the symbol for explained variance by its formula, which you already know from the example earlier. We could do the same for the total variance in the denominator, but we won't touch it for the proof, so let's not do it to keep it as simple as possible.
The individual prediction for each data point yi hat is given by the regression line. So we can replace yi hat in the formula by the standard formula for the regression line. Now you might know that the regression line always passes through a point that is given by the mean values of either variable x bar and y bar. This means you can express the intercept beta 0 hat in terms of these means and beta 1 hat. When you rearrange the terms, you will see that the numerator changed to the product of the slope of the regression beta 1 hat squared and the variance of the predictor. Now we take the square root and compare this to the definition of Pearson's r. Is this the same? You might see that this is true as long as beta 1 hat equals the covariance divided by the variance of x. This is indeed the case, so Pearson's r is the square root of r squared. Now, it might be unsatisfying to explain one aspect by introducing another one that needs explanation, in this case the formula for beta 1 hat, but this proof is quite lengthy and is too detached from the topic of this video, so I will not go into detail here. However, let's quickly do an intuitive sketch, especially one thing. It might make intuitive sense that the slope of the regression depends on the covariation, because we saw earlier that it is positive when the slope is also positive, and negative in case of a negative slope. However, why does the variance of x play a role, but not the variance of y? Let's simply try what happens when we individually change these components. Let's start with points lying perfectly on a line. The variance of x equals 4, the variance of y equals 9, the covariance is 6, and the slope is 1.5. Now imagine you take the rightmost point and increase the y value. This will naturally also increase the variance of y. And you see that the slope increases too. Didn't we say that the slope is not supposed to change with changes in the variance of y? You did increase the variance in y, but the driving force was actually that you also increased the covariance between x and y by moving this one point. As you would expect by the formula, increasing the covariance by 50% from 6 to 9 also led to an increase in the slope from 1.5 to 2.25. But let's try this again, but this time without changing the covariance. These are the original points, and now we will see that the slope does not change at all when we only change the variance of y. You see that the intercept can change though. Next, we change the covariance on its own and see that the slope changes too by the same percentage as the covariance and also the sign switches. When we change the variance in x next, the slope also changes, also with the same percentage. So the simulation shows that the slope indeed does not depend on the variance of y, but on the variance of x and the covariance. Of course, this is no final proof, but I hope it will still give you some degree of satisfaction. When we come back here and accept this quick sketch instead of a proof, we showed that r squared is indeed equal to the square of Pearson's r. So every time you see a correlation coefficient, you can square it and see what proportion of variance is explained by the model. And when r squared is given and there are only two variables involved, you can calculate their correlation by taking the square root. I say only two variables because you can also calculate r squared in a regression with multiple predictors, which I did not show you, but taking the square root of that will not give you the correlation of any of the variables involved. To wrap up, a few notes of caution. First, as it is true for all statistical techniques you learn in your first classes, there is no causality included. So high r squared values do not mean that you really explain anything in the sense that when you intervene on the predictor you will also change the outcome. It is basically just an overlap defined by the covariance, if you will. This is why some people talk about variance accounted for instead of explained, because our squared values do not directly give you explanations for anything. It also does not tell you if your analysis is valid or if there are assumptions violated. And it also does not tell you if you pick good predictors. A high variance explained might be helpful, but there still might be confounding or your predictor doesn't actually predict the outcome, but is rather a consequence. This is also why it can be problematic to pick predictors solely because they increase r squared. Actual understanding might suffer. Finally, r squared can only increase when you add more predictors, for instance in a regression. So it will approach one, which will almost always imply overfitting. To guard against that, you can calculate adjusted r squared, which takes the number of predictors into account and corrects for this effect. So R squared, the percent variance explained, is based on the partition of variance of the outcome into two parts, 
one part that is accounted for by a model and another part that is not. It is defined by how much of the variance in the outcome is accounted for over the total variance. Because there are only two parts of variance, you can also define it as one minus the percentage that was not explained by the model. And you can picture that by removing the effect of your model, in this case the regression line, and calculate how much your outcome still varies after that. And that is all I have for you today. I hope you found this helpful and tune in for the next video.